Dr. Jenica here talking about what a developmental neuropsychologist did for sleep training for their own child, namely telling you about what I did with my little one. So uh, a little bit of background, um, my little one had pretty severe colic as a newborn, a lot of reflux, um, tongue tie, cow's milk protein intolerance that, you know, we um, were finally able to figure out around like six weeks or so. So the first, you know, a uh, few, few months, that fourth trimester was really rough. My initial plan had been on doing La Paz, which is essentially, you know, waiting a moment before responding, um, which, you know, essentially helps prevent you waking your child up accidentally because sometimes newborns um, and um, young infants will sleep quite noisily. They might actually cry out in their sleep, but that might actually just signal them being in a lighter sleep stage. Um, so you might actually go in to check on them when they're crying only to find that you're not actually waking them up in that process. So um, that had been my plan, but because there were some medical issues, uh, you can bet that I was going kind of running in there whenever uh, she was crying out because I knew that she wasn't really feeling very good. And um, also for my family, um, the caregiving arrangement between my husband and I, um, it didn't really work very well for her to be crying for long periods of time in the night. It just didn't work with what uh, we were trying to achieve as a family. So um, also one of the main reasons why you don't typically sleep train or do cried out sleep training until four months is because of, um, you know, at that point, that's when most kids can sleep through the night without needing a feeding. So that's why typically it's not done earlier, um, except for certain cases. Um, so until four months, I did follow the American Academy of Pediatric Sleep Recommendations. So I did have my little one in the room with me. Um, uh, she was in her own bassinet. I am very much against uh, bed sharing, namely because 3,500 infants die every year in the U.S. alone due to um, primarily unsla unsafe sleep factors. So things like too much soft bedding, um, you know, strangulation, or you know, um, things that just uh, are are mostly preventable. So, um, you know, room sharing is recommended to decrease it, SIDS risk. Um, for the first year. However, bed sharing is never recommended. And um, again, most people who bed share will do so without issues. But um, in my eyes, I think that's a, a, you know, a risk that I'm not comfortable taking personally with my child. Um, now, uh, we did actually move her out of our room um, around four months, mainly because the SIDS risk at that point has um, decreased statistically significantly, uh, meaning that the risk is a lot lower once they've made it to four months. And at that point, I was noticing that I was actually waking her up. So when I would come in, um, you know, that would kind of wake her up and then she would end up waking me up in the middle of the night more because she was a noisy sleeper. So um, at that point, I started crib training, which I essentially got her used to sleeping in the crib. Um, and for the first um, for the first four months, I, I was doing a lot of down drowsy but awake, making sure that um, you know we were following um, you know the recommended wake windows, attuning you know to her signals that she was sleepy and anticipating them. So putting her down drowsy but awake before getting overtired was really um, you know, a huge thing for us. Um, and luckily, you know, um, when it came to napping, I actually found it easier to sleep train, you know, essentially starting with napping. Um, and I used kind of the pick up, put down and the patch or method kind of together. So, um, you know, I would stand kind of over her bassinet um, and, you know, would, you know, rock her into the point where she was drowsy, would put her down drowsy, but awake. If she cried, I would pick her up, soothe her again, get her drowsy and essentially repeat until she was able to stay asleep for her naps in the crib alone. And I did a similar method um, overnight as well um, during those first four months. And what I did was I really systematically tried to control both the environment and then change one thing at a time to figure out what might work or conversely what didn't really work. And so um, one thing that was really instrumental for us was making sure that the room was dark enough so we had double blackout shades. Um, so that's essentially, you know, a regular blackout shade plus one underneath that doesn't allow much light in. You shouldn't be able to see your hand in front of you when the lights are off in there essentially. 
um, in a pinch, you know, black construction paper or even tin foil can be really helpful. That's what I typically will bring on vacation is a roll of that or pick that up when I get to my destination because um, we do find that that makes a very big difference having the room dark. And then also a sound machine was um, was pretty instrumental for us for that first year because we live in an older house, the, you know, creaks and having a dog bark. Last thing you want to do is have, you know, an infant woken up by any ambient noise after you've tried so hard to put them down. And um, so for the first four months, um, you know, we just kind of made it through and then, you know, we really started to get pretty serious about sort of this behavioral sleep training, which essentially is, um, you know, following the different wake routines. So eat, play, sleep, watching for her sleepy cues, putting her down before um, she was getting overtired and then being consistent in how we responded. So um, namely, you know, uh, feeding when she was hungry, if it was, you know, something that she needed, um, you know, just reassurance and, you know, kind of patting her and putting her down and walking away, that shush pat method again um, was pretty helpful for us. And uh, we really tried altering the wake windows and uh, in a pretty systematic way between four and six months. Um, and tried introducing, you know, the dream feed and then eventually dropping the dream feed because that was no longer helpful at that point. And um, right before seven months, um, and this, you know, the whole time we've been, you know, fairly consistent in our approach. Um, and I was at the point where I was like, all right, you know, if by seven months she's not sleeping through the night, I'm going to start, you know, uh, cried out sleep training. I hadn't yet decided on extinction versus gradual extinction, which is more of like a Ferber or a taking care of babies method. They're essentially the same. Taking care of babies is just repackaging and slick marketing essentially, but it's Ferber. Um, and so the night before that I was due to start that, I gotten some interesting advice on one of the parenting boards, like the what to expect boards. And one of the moms there had said, you know what, around that time, what actually worked best for my child was not like equally spacing the wake windows, but doing a two, three, four hour wake windows. Holy moly, we changed that one thing and boom, started sleeping through the night, has slept through the night ever since. So, um, you know, all that early work that we did laying the foundation for good sleep and the consistency and the hard work, it did end up paying off. And we actually didn't end up needing to do any sort of cried out sleep training, although I was fully prepared to do it. Um, as I said, it was something that um, didn't quite work for our family because of the way that our um, child care schedules overlap between my husband and I. It wouldn't work to have, um, you know, the baby crying uh, for any sustained periods in the middle of the night, unfortunately. But um, that being said, I did actually poll all of my classmates who are all child psychologists on um, if they did an extinction cried out training or more of a graduated method a la Ferber or taking care of babies. And their response was, why would you go back in and check in on them? That's going to make the extinction burst worse, which is essentially having a, um, having, you know, a more, uh, reactive response when you initially uh, start the sleep training. So um, I hope this was helpful in talking a little bit more about what I did and thanks so much for tuning in.